Okay, let's just give it a minute um, just to give people an opportunity to get on. Morning, sir. Afternoon, Duan. Uh, so just, sorry, sir, is this lesson four? Um, we're going to do lesson four and five and maybe take a look at a little bit of lesson six today. But lesson six, our focus for tomorrow is going to be lesson six and the work that you have to do over the weekend. So I'm going to cover lesson four and five today. And I'm really going to rush through lesson four while well, rush through both of them because um, I want to get through and start off with protein synthesis. We've got to finish protein synthesis this week. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Did you watch um, the recording of lesson four yesterday that I gave? Oh, no, sorry, I didn't. I was just, um, I had trouble finishing the work I already had for the day, so I just decided to leave it. No, no problem. I totally understand. Okay, I think let's let's get started because I'm going to going to post the recording of this anyway, and uh, let's see who's going to join as we go along. Okay. Um, so today um, we're going to cover lesson four and five, and then possibly a little bit of lesson six. Tomorrow, my focus, I want to focus on lesson six and finish off protein synthesis to, uh, this week and give you the tasks. There's lots of tasks that we're going to give you tomorrow to do. Uh, so listen up for where I'm going to give you tasks that you guys need to do. Okay, so I, I love lesson four. It's, it's a very interesting lesson. It's a, it's a nice one to ask in, ask in the exams as well. I love asking something about DNA profiling in, in the tests and the exams um, as, uh, because there's a lot of interpretation they can ask you. So for them, it's an, it's an easy, it's level two or level three questions. It's a bit more difficult than your usual questions, um, but it's easy level two and easy level three questions. Um, if you don't overthink it, but you read your questions very carefully. So lesson four is on DNA profiling. We also used to call it DNA fingerprinting, but I want to warn you not to use the word fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting anymore. They do not accept it at the end of the year exams. Last year, they made an exception, but they said they won't do it again. Please do not use the word DNA fingerprinting. We use the words DNA profiling. So in terms of this lesson, what do we need to know? We need to know a basic definition of a DNA profile. We also need to know what is the uses of a DNA profile. That is a very common question. And then also, I need to be able to interpret a DNA profile. So what is a DNA profile? Please, again, don't use the word fingerprint like we used to. We're not, they're not accepting it any longer. So what we basically do with a DNA profile, and I want you to go and watch the videos on Google Classroom because they actually show you how to extract DNA and they actually show the process. Um, there's an animation on this and the actual process in the videos that are placed on Google Classroom. And you can go and watch how they do this. Uh, it's basically what we call electrophoresis of DNA. And please remember that this is not DNA. Uh, when we're talking about DNA profiling, we're actually not talking about the physical sequence of the DNA. What it is based on is what we call random repeats in the DNA. So in your non-coding part of your DNA, there are certain um, codes that repeat themselves over and over and over and over again for a certain number of times. And your DNA profile, when they actually get it, and I'm not, um, you can go watch the videos of how they get it. They actually isolate these random repeats. And they can put it onto, they run electricity through it. 
and um, but what basically happens is you can get a it looks like a barcode um, that's unique to you that is unique to your DNA. Now it's going to be similar to the um, it's going to be similar, but as I said, it's unique to you. But there are going to be similarities between your DNA and the DNA of your family members, of your biological family members and especially those of your mother and father. Half of your DNA profile has to fit your mother and half of your DNA profile has to fit your father. And so that's why they can also use it for paternity or maternity testing, determining the father or, or the mother of a child can be done through the, uh, one of the things that can be done through DNA profiling. Okay, so they extract the DNA, and when you watch the video under lesson four on DNA extraction, I would like to challenge you to also go and, uh, because that's one of the practicals we normally do in class, and we can't do it now, but you can actually do it at home with a little bit of surgical spirits um, and some washing powder or meat tenderizer, you can actually extract DNA from banana, works well, or strawberries work, works well as well, and you can extract DNA. So they extract the DNA firstly, then they arrange it on a barcode pattern um, through electrophoresis, and then the pattern matches with the sequence of base pairs from both parents, as we said already, and they call that your DNA profile, they used to call it the no, fingerprint, but again, be careful, don't use the word fingerprint any longer. Then, when we take a look at our DNA, most of our DNA is the same between all of us, but there are some things that are different, and your DNA profile is based on those things that are different between one person to the next. Now, each person has a unique DNA profile, except for identical twins. Identical twins will have the same DNA and thus have the same DNA profile. Now, this is typical of a question that you would receive in the uh, tests and exams on DNA profiling. And we're going to go through quite a few of these examples today. So this can be used for forensic evidence, the DNA profile in court cases. and not, uh, they use the non-coding parts of the DNA, the differ, and then each person, as I said to you, has their own unique uh, DNA profile, so we can use it for forensic evidence in court. We can get this DNA from uh, lots of sources, uh, your skin cells, blood, saliva, your hair can be found at a crime scene, and then they can extract the DNA and run a DNA profile on it. Just something that you have to remember. One of the problems that we have with DNA profiling, and we're going to discuss a few afterwards, is the fact that uh, sometimes the DNA that you can get from the crime scene, because it's only a little bit of skin or a hair or blood, um, the DNA profile can be broken or what we say fragmented. Okay, before we go and we solve this case over here, Tepu, you have a question? So why is that they use the non-coding part of it and not the coding part? What different, what different does it make? When okay. it? The big difference that it makes is that if we take a look at the coding part of your DNA, uh, we find that, um, that the coding part of your DNA tends to be a lot more similar between you and the next person than the non-coding part of your DNA. So there's lots more similarities in the coding part. And also uh, what we find in the coding part is the coding part doesn't have as many what we call in the DNA random repeats. Now, um, to answer this question properly, I can't answer it here now and we're gonna waste too much time, but especially if you go and you watch the DNA fingerprinting video, um, of Bozeman Science, and you, uh, Mr. Anderson explains it quite well in why uh, we find these random repeats within the non-coding part of your DNA. 
that we get the uh, DNA barcode from or the DNA profile from. So please go and watch the video um, under lesson four on DNA fingerprinting, the one from Bozeman Science, where Mr. Anderson explains that very well. And you'll get some more detail there, Jeffrey. Okay. Yes. Okay, then let's quickly solve this case. Okay, so uh, when we have a case like this, I want you to also note that when we get the DNA from the crime scene, and we've got some DNA from the crime scene right here, and we've got the DNA profile of that. But before we can actually effectively um, assess whether this DNA belongs to suspect one, two, or three, I also need to remember that maybe some of the DNA has been contaminated from the DNA of the victim, which was also on the crime scene and involved. So I need to be very careful because sometimes we find that maybe that's not just the blood of the suspect, or that could also be some of the blood on that knife from the victim. So depending on the situation, I might see that some of the DNA is going to, and let me just get the highlight here, some of this DNA is maybe going to match that of the victim. And that might affect the results of my DNA test. In this case, let's assume that that DNA, the blood from the knife, is actually not from the victim. Although I want to make a note afterwards when we have gone through this. Um, but let's assume that that blood, none of that blood was from the victim. And all of the blood on that knife came from the suspect. So let's take a look at the match. If we go through this, this first line matches suspect two. The second line matches suspect one and two, as well as three. The third line um, matches one, two, and three. Then my fourth line over here matches only suspect two, and that, that's, a, that's our giveaway there. Then our next line only matches number one and number two. Not that one's slightly off there. And then the last line only matches number one and number two. So, guys, what do you think? You can put it in the chat box. What do you think? Who is the suspect in this case? Is it suspect one, suspect two, or suspect three? Who is most likely? Who was most like? Who does that blood on the knife most likely belong? Yes, the tabu. You're quite right. It is suspect too. But, but, I also want you to note a few things. I want you to note the the number of matches that we have between suspect one and suspect two. There's lots of matches over there, and that says to me that there's also a likelihood that suspect one and suspect two could be related to one another. Although if you take a look at their pictures, you wouldn't say that, but never mind that. Uh, because of the matches in the DNA, um, there's a possibility that suspect one and suspect two could be related to one another. Not only that, if I take a look at the victim's DNA and suspect two's DNA, I can also find there's actually three matches over there which says that the victim and suspect two could also be possibly uh, uh, related to one another. But that wasn't asked. Um, if they don't ask anything about that, don't try and interpret further like I have now. Only if they ask, do you take that interpretation further? Let's take a look at some other examples we're gonna do in a moment. Okay, so let's take a look at how we can actually use this DNA profiling that you see here. So we can identify crime suspects in forensic investigations like we just did now. We can also prove paternity. We're going to have a, a test run on that in a moment. Uh, we can also determine the probability and our causes for genetic defects. So depending on the random repeats that we find uh, on a DNA profile, we can actually determine whether a person is more susceptible to some genetic diseases. We can also trace some missing persons. So we, by using the DNA, I can identify maybe uh, whether a missing person 
or a person that, that has maybe um, amnesia, we can determine whether they are uh, belong to a, a, fam, uh, a certain family, or we can also establish the compatibility of tissue types for organ transplants. So if there's enough matches in the DNA between two persons, it means that the organ that they might donate is more compatible and is least likely to be rejected by the person receiving the donated organ. Um, another thing that they can do is identify people that's been in an accident um, that, um, or even deceased persons, they can actually identify some people that way. Here's another example. Now, be careful of this example. This is a typical one that you would also get in the tests and exams. And remember that half of your DNA you get from mom and half of your DNA you get from dad. And so we need to eliminate, if we're looking for who's the daddy over here, we need to determine, firstly, we need to eliminate all of the DNA that comes from mom. And we're not taking a look at the DNA that's coming from mom. We only want to take a look at the DNA that's possibly coming from dad. So let's do that first. Firstly, if we take a look over here, that line over there, that belongs to mom. So he receives it from mom. We're not going to take a look at that DNA over there. Same goes for that one over there and the last one over there. So we're only taking a look at the three lines that are left to determine who the dad is. So if we take a look at the three lines that are left, this first one matches dad two and dad three. That second one that remains left matches dad one. Uh, sorry, matches dad one and dad three, yes. And the last one matches dad two and dad three. Okay, so who's got the most matches? Guys, you can put your answers in the chat box or we only a few people, you say you can say, you can put up your hand or you can just say, okay, yes, Njabulu, you're quite right. It's dad three. Dad three is most likely the dad of this child. Again, we can go into further interpretation into this and see that there are some other relationships as well. There's a good likelihood because of matches that dad three and that two could be related to one another, possibly brothers. Okay, sorry, I'll skip the bit now. Okay, let's take a look at some more examples over here. Uh, okay, we did that one. Okay, so over here, we've got another paternity test over there. And again, they made it a lot easier. This time they made it a lot easier for us by color coding already those matches that are matching with mom. Um, so if we take a look at it, that one matches mom, that one matches mom, that one matches mom, this one and that one matches mom. So we're only taking a look at the red bars. And if we take a look at the red bars, uh, we see matching male one, Matching my one, matching my one, matching my one, matching my one and two, and matching my one only. So it's more likely that male one is the father of the child in this case. Just want to move this here a bit. There we go. Okay, now. Let's take a look at another crime scene investigation. And just by eyeballing it very quickly, I want you guys just to say in the, in the chat box for me, please, can you say whether it is suspect one, suspect two, or suspect three? Suspect one, two, or three. In this case, Jabulu, again, you are first. Congratulations. Yes. It is suspect two. Suspect two is most likely the one that was that the DNA sample was found at the crime scene. Now I want to go and I want you to also think about the following. Suspect two was on the crime scene. 
is he necessarily the, the person that did the crime? The question is, suspect two was on the crime scene. We know his DNA is on the crime scene. Is he necessarily the person that did the crime? And of course, no. Matabu, you're quite right. Um, he's not necessarily the person that committed the crime because we don't know the full extent of what happened at the crime scene. All we're saying is that at some stage, he was at the crime scene and his DNA was found there. Whether the crime, uh, whether the, the, he left his DNA there before the crime, whether he left it there after the crime, or whether he actually committed the crime, that question has not been answered yet. All we know is that he was there, and you're quite right. All we know is that he was present there at some stage. Or maybe, Latabu, you're making another assumption. Maybe his DNA was planted there. Okay, so be careful of that as well. And that is when we get to, um, and we're going to go through that learner activity in a moment, or you're going to do that learner activity later. And that's what I want you to go through when you go for or against um, DNA profiling. I want you to remember that what, what, what are the positives and the negatives. So let's take a look at the positives first. We can prove paternity, maternity, we can trace lost relatives, separated siblings, we can ID missing persons, ID the remains of victims of accidents, we can detect the probability of genetic defects, we can also use it as forensic evidence, and we can identify the origins of uh, products uh, that we got from threatened species, like rhino horn. If I can match the DNA or the DNA profile of rhino horn, to a certain rhino, then I know where that came from. But, but, there's problems as well. There's negatives as well. Okay, firstly, there might be inaccuracy in the profiling process. Errors may occur. And I said to you, especially when we find DNA and we only find small sections of skin or hair, and that DNA may be fragmented. So unfortunately, in that process, we might lose some of the DNA and not all of the DNA will show up properly onto the profile. Secondly, there might be human error in the results of the interpretation. DNA can be planted. Skin can be planted. We can get hair from a person and plant it on a crime scene. The, um, uh, and so there might be human errors also in the interpretation of what actually happened at the crime scene. So we must be careful of that. Or we might interpret even the DNA itself, the DNA profile, we might determine incorrectly. Also, there might be discrimination against people who will, are ill or possibly ill. If you're an insurance company, you would like to have this knowledge before you insure someone. Now I can identify genetic diseases. Do I insure this person or not? Or do I charge you more to be able to insure him? because I know he possibly has a genetic disease. Good for the insurance company, not so good for the person being insured. Also, costs, not all people will be able to afford it. It's quite a high cost to do DNA profiling at this stage. Also, there's no uniform standard for forensic labs around the world. And so we try, of course, to eliminate any mistakes, but unfortunately, though, there's no set standard that they have set for forensic labs around the world. Also DNA samples, as we said, may be planted at a crime scene, some blood, bits of hair, maybe some skin cells, or small sam samples may actually, if we get a fragmented samples, um, and small samples of skin might have the DNA that is quite identical to one another, especially when you have um, if it's uh, within a family and so on, you might get identical DNA fragments. Okay. There's one more learning activity within these notes that you guys must do for me. And also, if you take a look, and we're going to go through that in a moment. Um, if you take a look at your Google Classroom under Lesson 5, under Lesson 5, which is now at the top, you will see there's also a fast paper in there. 
Um, I believe it's the 2017 paper two, May, June paper two. And if you answer question 3.3 .3 on there, that is also a DNA profiling question under lesson five. Okay, now, before I move on to RNA and DNA, uh, RNA, um, can I ask, is there any questions with regards to profiling before we move on? You're also welcome to put any questions in the chat box. So one more time, why do we use um, non-coding DNA? Okay, so non-coding mm -hmm. DNA has a lot of what we call random repeats inside it. And the random repeats is what is picked up when we do a DNA profile and we run that DNA through electrophoresis. But um, as I said to you guys, if you watch the video, um, especially this one, uh, this one on Bozeman science. Um, so let me just get back to lesson four. It's not lesson four now, it's disappeared. But if you watch the, uh, the, the DNA fingerprinting one, um, that video, if you watch that video, um, it's from Bozeman Sciences, Mr. Anderson explaining. If you watch that one, you'll see why, why we pick up, he explains why uh, it's the non-coding part and he explains what the random repeats are is quite well. Guys, you don't need to know that detail. It's nice to know and it's nice to know where they get that, but be careful, you don't need to memorize that detail for the end of the exam. Just one thing as I, uh, what I'm thinking of now, before we, um, before we move on, is that when you answer the questions, remember, uh, when you, especially when there's matches, you've got to say, you've got to state it as follows. The bars of the DNA profile matches the bars of the DNA profile um, on the crime scene. Okay, so you've got to mention that there's a match. What is the match? The match is of the bars of the DNA profile. If you don't mention that it's the bars that match at, of the DNA profile, then unfortunately they don't award the marks. Okay. Now, Jeff, would you have another question? Yes. Um, so when you say non-coding DNA, is it is, is that um, mitochondrial DNA? And I think. No, it's um, not the other one. DNA. No. Remember that within your DNA, only about, um, I think it's, um, it's, it's a very little amount. Um, I can't remember the percentage. It's, it's less than 10% of your DNA actually codes for something, actually codes for a protein. Most of your DNA actually doesn't code for any protein. And we used to call that junk DNA. We don't call it junk DNA because it does have a purpose, but it doesn't specifically code for proteins. And so that's why we call it non-coding DNA. It does help in to, to keep mutations under control. It also helps in the um, RNA in protein synthesis. It also helps in DNA replication, but it doesn't code for a specific protein. And so that um, is non-coding. And within that, there's a lot of variation in the non-coding parts of your DNA. And so that's why for DNA profiling, it works well. But my mitochondrial and the other one, uh, does it also fall under uh, non-coding or are they coding no. DNA? No, uh, that's mostly coding DNA. Mm, okay. okay. Okay, so let us go so, then, yes. What? Do we have the memo for um the the twenty seventeen the May June twenty seventeen? Uh, no, you don't have the memo yet. I will only place the memo after you've done the question, so that uh, you can attend the question first, and then we will go through and we'll discuss it. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Mister so, Kim, sir. Yes. Um. So. When, when we try to identify the father and mm -hmm. we see that there's a match with um, 
say there's one bar that matches with the father, but yes. let's say that that bar also matches with the mother. How would, how would we know which one it came from? I would rather eliminate that one and not consider taking a look at that bar whatsoever because I already know that it belongs to the mom. I will not interpret it for the father as well. And also what the danger is of that is that the moment that ha that happens, you've got to realize that they, there's a good possibility then that the mom and the dad are related, which is not good. Now, it sounds very harsh, but it does happen. It does happen. Uh, uh, incest is actually more common than we might want to think. Especially if we take a look, for example, in many royal families where, um, where basically you have to marry within the royal family to keep the blood pure. And that's why you get things like blue blood disease or bleeders disease that is common within royal families of Europe. Um, and so that uh, you remember that if there's a match like that, it's most likely that there's some um, there's some family relationship between the mom and the dad. Then. But so how do we know that it came from the mom and not the dad? We don't. Um, if there's a match on both, we don't know. Then in that case, you don't know. We don't know okay. when they received it from which one. So just cancel it out. You cancel it out and you try to consider the rest that's not a match to mom, yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay guys. Okay. Yes. When you say coding DNA repeats, does that mean that it is most like to be it, it is most likely to be kind of the same in um, individuals? Uh, yes, coding DNA tends to have more matches between individuals than non-coding DNA because what we find it's, a, a, it's for example, if you take a look at coding DNA, the, the code for the skin is the same. Skin my skin, skin is skin. Whether it's my skin or your skin, it's the same. So most of that gene is going to be similar. Now the melanin inside the skin, that might be a different gene. So there might be a little bit of a difference between the amount of melanin um, in the gene that's produced by yours and then the amount of melanin produced for me. That might be different. Or blue eyes and brown eyes, there might be differences there. But the differences are not going to get picked up in a DNA profile. Those differences yeah. you're not going to pick up in a DNA profile. Uh, you will pick that up in a DNA sequence. Because the sequence gives the exact code of A, A, C, C, T, D, 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 whatever. And that's DNA sequencing. That's not profiling. And DNA yeah. sequencing is a lot more complex than DNA profiling. Okay. Because I thought um, we could use that for the reason behind why um, non coding DNA is not used for profiling. Yeah, now that is one of the reasons why it's not used because you don't get random repeats in, in coding DNA as much as in non-coding DNA. And also it's a lot more similar between, um, uh, non uh, coding DNA is a lot more similar between different people than non-coding parts. Okay, guys, let us quickly review lesson five. Um, before we move, uh, before the lesson ends, uh, because I don't want to focus too much on, um, uh, on lesson five tomorrow. I want to focus on lesson six. And guys, if I don't get to finish this, please go watch the video on um, that I've already posted under lesson five, reviewing lesson five. Okay. Uh, that file and I can do the if no. So, so we won't do lesson five tomorrow. I'm not going to do lesson five tomorrow. You'll see it's a very short lesson. Um, and so I'm not going to have too much to bother with it. I'm going to focus on lesson six tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Lesson five is on ribonucleic acid. 
Okay, so what do I need to know? I need to know where do we find ribonucleic acid or RNA? Okay, so um, people, we're going to find that we have different types of RNA. We've got mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. mRNA or messenger RNA, ladies and gentlemen, is found in the nucleus and also on the ribosome. So it's found in the cytoplasm, and it's basically what it says it is. It's mRNA stands for messenger RNA, so it carries the message from the DNA in the nucleus, carries it out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm to the ribosome, which is the, the building sites of proteins. And so that's why we can find it in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm, as well as on the ribosome. Then, the RNA, ladies and gentlemen, is only found in the cytoplasm. We don't find any tRNA or transfer RNA within the nucleus. We also have rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA. We don't really focus on it, but it's inside, it's a structural component of the ribosome. Also, we need to know that RNA plays a role in protein synthesis, and in lesson six, we're going to focus on protein synthesis. Important about the structure of RNA, I must remember that it's a single strand, and it consists out of nucleotides, just like the DNA. It's also consisting out of the monomers called nucleotides. And each of those nucleotides contains a sugar. But now each sugar in, in, uh, with DNA, it was a deoxyribose. Now it's a ribose sugar. And then also it contains a phosphate and a nitrogen base, just like DNA. Then. Under the nitrogenous bases, I want you to remember that adenine, cytosine, and guanine are going to be the same, but thymine gets replaced with uracil inside RNA. And then we also, you have to know a basic stick diagram of mRNA or tRNA just to be able to, interp uh, uh, to, to, be able to identify each one. Okay. Location, I'm not going to uh, fuss too much on. Let's just go through one more thing over here. Or let me go to uh, the let me go to the types of RNA and then to the differences between DNA and RNA, which is more of a focus of what we need to focus on. So mRNA is messenger RNA. We find with messenger RNA, it's a single strand of RNA. Um, not a double strand like DNA. Um, it's formed from the nucleus, so it's uh, uh, from the in the nucleus from the DNA. So it's basically a copy of the DNA. It forms from DNA. It's a copy of the DNA. It forms from the a template of DNA, and it carries the genetic message from DNA to the ribosome, which is the place where proteins are produced. You'll see that in more detail when we get to protein synthesis. Secondly, guys, transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is responsible for carrying amino acids or the building blocks of proteins towards the ribosomes where they're going to be built. So basically, they are construction workers that fetches bricks and places them in the right place. Um, it looks like a little hairpin. This is the typical shape that we find with tRNA. And it's got what we call on the side here an anticodon. And that anticodon will match or complementary match what we call the codon on the mRNA. So every three nitrogenous bases or every three nucleotides is going to form a codon on the mRNA which is complementary to the anticodon on the tRNA. Okay, then people, RNA, all you need to know about it is that it's a structural component of the ribosome. Let's quickly take a look at the differences between DNA and RNA. DNA is a double helix, it's a double strand, but RNA is a single strand. DNA contains deoxyribose sugar and RNA only a ribose sugar. Then nitrogenous bases for DNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. 
but thiamine gets replaced by uracil in RNA. And it, what we find with DNA, because of the double strand and the complementary theory, we find that there's always the same amount of adenine and thiamine and the same amount of guanine and cytosine. But in RNA, because it's only a single strand, we find that we do not get that repetition. So the ACGs and Us can be of any amount. I just want to show you, we're going to take some questions, try and take some questions in a moment, and we'll recap on this if it's needed tomorrow. Let me show you just the diagrams. You don't have to do not memorize this. This is not for um, memorizing. This is just for you to see the differences. DNA, you can see a double strand, RNA, single strand. DNA, take a look over there. There is an oxygen in RNA, that's the sugar, and then the oxygen is gone in DNA. So deoxy, one less oxygen. Then lastly, if we take a look at the bases over here, we can see that, that our thymine contains a CH3 over there, while uracil only contains an H over there. And that's why we have to give it a different name. Okay, guys, I know I've gone through this very quickly. Uh, we've only got about a minute left. Can I take maybe just one question before we end off? But go and watch the video as well that I posted earlier for the 